Welcome to the fifth episode of European Schoolnet podcast series. Today it's hosted in collaboration with the Menable project that is addressing online gender-based violence. Uh, today we'll be discussing uh, priorities and efforts that big tech companies, particularly Meta, are making to enhance online safety. In today's digital age, big tech companies dominate online with business models centered on data collection and targeted advertising. This data often comes from user engagement with addictive content, which can be unsuitable for younger audiences. In this episode, we delve into a conversation with Meta, one of the leading players in the tech industry, to explore the priorities and responses to online safety risks. We will discuss the measures they implement to safeguard users, particularly women, from harmful content, and go through the ongoing challenges in online safety. My name is Ina and I work in digital citizenship department where we focus on creating digital, safer digital environment for younger people, younger audiences. Um, we help them uh, avoid online risks and also embrace the opportunities that technology and internet provide. I would like to introduce my guest today, Cindy Southworth, a head of women's safety at Meta. Cindy, thank you so much for joining us today. I can only imagine how busy your schedule is, so I really appreciate you being here. And thanks for having me and thanks for covering this important topic. Thanks a lot. So let's dive di directly into it. Uh, so maybe the first question, just to start, set the scene. Could you please um, um, give us an overview of online safety priorities that are uh, currently covered in the uh, tech industry? Um, yeah, what does online safety agenda look like? That's a huge topic, and I we could probably cover that for many days, but I'll cover my slice of it because uh, in the subject matter expert uh, sort of umbrella that I cover around uh, women's safety and gender-based violence prevention, um, I'll cover sort of my piece because obviously we also look at, you know, children's safety, youth well-being, um, you know, mental health prevention, all of those topics, but my piece, really my expertise for 30 years in the nonprofit sector is the women's safety component. So I'll I'll stay within that lane today. And what's exciting for me is that the entire tech field is really looking at this issue. It's something that I've spent my sort of life's work looking at for over 30 years and to see the technology field, but also the United Nations, the White House, the Council of Europe, many, many groups are now looking at these issues. And it's not a new phenomenon. Um, you know, obviously, and sadly, unfortunately, offline gender-based violence has impacted women and girls for millennia. This is not a new thing, but that offline um, gender-based violence often also shows up online. And so as Meta has been looking at this issue for many years, something that I'm aware of because of my work with them and my nonprofit life, um, it's nice to see all these other institutions and entities joining the discussion and working together, doing cross industry and private sector, public sector partnerships um, to make the world safer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for sharing. It's really impressive that now the attention is given to to these priorities. And um, so, yeah, it's absolutely significant portion of this online risk are falling under gender based violence um, uh, umbrella and, of course, targeted women as well, because we know that women are facing particular uh, risks online. Um, could you perhaps before we delve into specifics, uh, walk us through your career journey? Um, what are your objectives uh, for driving? change what made you you know ch uh, choose this path sure so I um, ended up sort of falling into the path this path a little bit by accident I was working in the gender-based violence field and I was you know answering the helpline you know working to end sexual violence and domestic violence working to do child sexual abuse prevention work but because I had grown up in a rather tech savvy house my father was a very early um, technologist I was the one that was fixing the computers, installing the fax machines, setting up email because everyone else was afraid of the tech devices. And so in the late 90s, I realized that our entire movement, the activists in the field, were fairly afraid of technology. And so I founded in, it was actually July 17th, 2000, 24 years ago, I founded the Safety Net Tech Project at the US National Network to End Domestic Violence. Uh, it's techsafety.org. 
and it looked at all things technology and gender-based violence. So everything from tech misuse by abusers, perpetrators, and stalkers, and then also how to harness technology to benefit survivors. So everything from apps and data privacy, the power of encryption to support survivors and protect those really important confidential conversations, um, you know, all all things technology and gender-based violence. And I just spent the past three days with my former colleagues and their whole network that they've created. And so it was a really um, heartwarming experience to be with them. And in that work, I ended up advising many different tech companies um, over the the 24 years that I was with that project, or um, 20, I guess, because I've been with Meta now for four. And I was on the safety advisory councils of Twitter, Uber, Airbnb, Facebook. Um, I advised Microsoft, Google, you name it. But what I saw Facebook doing really from very early on, I advised them starting in 2009, was leading the way when it came to image abuse prevention. They were out front um, defining um, sex extortion in 2012 and clarifying the non-consensual intimate image abuse definition, starting to use reactive hashing, and I'll get into what that means in a bit. But what I saw excited me and I thought, okay, if we could really lead the way um, as a company in preventing the resharing of intimate images and preventing harm, there's real potential to make change. And so in July of 2020, I joined the company as our head of women's safety and I don't do the work alone. I am surrounded by you know, really phenomenal feminist activists that have come inside from the nonprofit sector and the, the group of us do this work and we work with engineers and policy people and um, investigators and others, but it's, um, it's a real honor to get to do the work inside now. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing, Cindy. It's really impressive and it's always a pleasure to meet such dedicated professionals. And actually with this, I would like to ask you a question because I feel that, uh, you know, I would like to embrace this narrative and show how much big tech companies actually do on uh, efforts that they do on online safety, because I feel that sometimes the narrative of, um, you know, the cases that where big tech companies uh, neglected certain risks or downplay certain risks, they go viral. And those cases are really well known, but I feel like not all users pay enough attention to the, to the other side of the story. So that's why I would like to really get to, get to know more about it. And with this, I would like to ask you a question, whether, you believe that, of course, from from the uh, what you already said, I, I, I'm pretty sure that's the case. But I would like you to, you know, elaborate a little bit more on that. Whether you believe that Matter is doing enough to minimize those risks, um, because obviously it's in, probably impossible to eliminate them completely. Given that uh, there's millions of users on the platforms, they spend hours and hours online. So we cannot, uh, perhaps it's too optimistic to eliminate risk completely, but do you feel that currently it's on the right track to kind of minimize those risks to the extent that is possible? It's it's a hard question to answer. I mean, because, to, you know, what is minimizing risk? I mean, I, I will say that one of the things that I am most proud of that we have done as a company is create um, stopncii.org, which is a prevention tool and it's cross industry. So we we funded it, we built it. I don't even know how many, 40, 50, 100 of our staff worked on building it and then we handed it to a nonprofit. They own and operate it, which is just unheard of for a company to build something and then give it to an NGO and say, it's yours now. Com completely, it's a gift. And this nonprofit, um, the UK Revenge Porn Helpline, owns and operates it and runs it. And they have over a hundred nonprofits around the world that partner with them. And what happens is if you have access to an intimate image or video that you're worried your ex-partner might share online on any one of 12 platforms and, and growing, we're recruiting more tech companies every single day. There's a bunch in the wings that are working on onboarding right now that are not quite public. You can go to a website, stopncii.org, and on your own device, you don't actually share your intimate imagery with anyone. You create a unique hash, which is a series of letters and numbers. And this hash, it's like a digital fingerprint. It's unique to that image or that video. And if somebody tries to upload the same image, so your ex tries to upload that same image or video to one of the 12 participating platforms, and of course, Facebook threads and Instagram are three of those 12, it'll be a match because the same sort of digital fingerprint for that photo or that video is going to be the same. If your ex tries to upload it, there'll be a match. 
it'll be re reviewed by a human briefly to make sure that it is intimate imagery and it's not a photo of a woman running for office because we don't want this tool to be misused. Um, and then it'll be confirmed it is intimate imagery. It'll be removed. The second time there's a match, there's no human review. There doesn't need to be. It's been confirmed and it's blocked instantly. And so the, the power of this is it it lets survivors sleep at night. They they feel like they're taking power back. And so for people that have been losing sleep, terrified that these images would be shared, stopncii.org gives power back. And it has a sister project and it's takeitdown.nickmic.org for young people, for somebody who's under 18 in the imagery, you go to, to takeitdown.nickmic.org and it's the same exact tool, but it's it's for the for young folks because the, the laws are different. And so there has to be two tools, stopnci.org if you're over 18 and takeitdown.nickmic.org if you're under 18. And I have to say that is something that I'm immensely proud of that our company has done. And so, you know, with your question is like, I don't know that, you know, how you answer it, but this is something I'm just immensely proud of. Yeah, absolutely. That's impressive. But yes, I would. Uh, I wanted to hear that there is this ethical commitment. You know, a big, big step that is uh, taken. And uh, I believe that all users need to know a little bit more about it because obviously we work in this field of online safety, especially for the um, uh, project that we are running on behalf of the European Commission and the uh, scope of European strategy for better internet for kids. Um, we we work closely with. Uh, representatives from uh, online safety departments and we know the dedication that's been put we are aware of all these projects but i think it's it's really nice that um you know this becomes more of a known narrative for regular users as well, as well. so that's really great um so we kind of already touched upon policies. Um, if there's anything else that you would like to elaborate more on uh, policies that matter specifically um, uh, in, uh, implemented to tackle online sexual abuse, for instance, if there is anything uh, in particular that you've been working on? I, especially in this um, current age around uh, concerns around deep fakes or synthetic imagery, I think it's important to know that we not only strictly prohibit the sharing of non-consensual intimate imagery or NCII, as I was mentioning, um, we also absolutely um, prohibit the, the sharing or the threatening to share, which sometimes people refer to as sextortion. And the threatening to share is so, so, so um, problematic. And that's something we take very, very seriously. But we've been also prohibiting synthetic imagery um, for many years, since before I joined the company in 2020. So it's not just something that is newsworthy and being talked about now. This is something we've considered um, the same as authentic content for many years because the whole purpose of it is to cause harm. And so for us, it doesn't matter whether it's authentic content or synthetic content, we treat it the same. And so that's really important for people to know if somebody, whether they use old school technology like Photoshop or whether they're using AI to put your face on a piece of, of nude imagery, we are going to remove that content regardless of whether it's authentic or synthetic. Um, please report it. Um, and if you have access to it, go to stopncii.org and create a hash of it so that we can prevent it on other platforms. Um, and then we also have another policy. Maybe it's not fully nude or sexual. Maybe it's just sexualized and derogatory. We have a, a policy under a bullying and harassment policies that gets at those just really offensive derogatory images that are really sort of designed to drive women off out of public spaces. And so we have a, a policy there um, that gets at those types of images that you can also report. So we, we do want people to be reporting content to us so that we can take action on it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. So you mentioned that reporting is, is a big, big uh, um, step here. So what happens when, uh, could you yeah, walk me through this process from the point that users report content? What happens next? How long does it take? What teams are involved? What is the process behind the scenes uh, from the point that user report uh, flagging content? Uh, yeah, alarming content. So we recruit um staff in multiple languages we've got we have teams reviewing reports 24 hours a day seven days a week in over 70 languages and it's not just fluency in the languages we want them culturally fluent so we want native speakers who understand not only the language but the culture the context because we understand that there's so much involved when you're reviewing content and when it comes to non-consensual intimate imagery beyond actioning the content and removing it 
We also use that same hashing technology when you report in-app. So if you report content that you find on Instagram, we are going to put it in a, that will create a hash, just like I mentioned for stopncii.org, put it in a data bank so that if you report in-app, we were, we're going to make sure you don't have to keep reporting the same piece of content over and over. You only need to report it once. And if that same exact image um, is tried to be posted again on Instagram or on Facebook, we'll catch it because of that hash. Um, it'll keep it from being posted again and again. Um, and so the, the that technology helps you not have to keep reporting over and over. Um, so we're, uh, we've been doing that really since 2017 using that hashing technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, very, very advanced, of course, uh, no surprises here. Uh, and actually continue talking about the advanced technologies. Um, of course, I presume your yeah, reporting is not enough. So are there any AI tools that help detect this type of content? So we've been using what's called machine learning or AI, AI people are talking about a lot right now. But in terms of artificial intelligence or machine learning, um, proactive detection is how we refer to it to identify harmful content and remove it for years. And it's getting better and better. Our classifiers that we train um, to identify harmful content and remove it before anyone reports it to us have been getting better in the four years that I've been in with the company. I've seen them improve. And so, for example, and we re and we report on this every single quarter. So if you go to our um, you can go and check out in our transparency center every single quarter we release our statistics and for example hate speech we removed 98 percent of our hate speech on instagram before and we found it and actioned it before people reported it to us and 95 percent of the hate speech on facebook we were able to find it um, using proactive detection and action it before people reported it to us. So these are really strong classifiers. The machine learning is working really well. We can sort of program it with with slurs and words that that are offensive and violate our community standards and then find this content and remove it before people have to see it and report it to us. And so we're some, and I will admit, some of the classifiers are stronger than others because for example, bullying and harassment is so often contextualized. I may say affectionately, oh, you're a jerk, meaning it with love. And that is hard for a classifier to understand. So one of the things that with bullying and harassment, we often have to rely on reports from our users because it's hard to tell when somebody is saying something in an endearing, loving way, but it's actually a word that might be harmful. So it's it, sometimes context really does make a difference. But our classifiers for hate speech are actually quite strong. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, I can imagine that was actually my next question, because when, when it comes to the point that human content management s uh, system comes in, into play, I wonder, it can be very, very difficult to find this thin line between um, you know, this is just the way people communicate among them, each other. Of course, sometimes it's very obvious what's happening, that this is clearly harassment, but in other cases, it can be a very thin line. Um, so I wonder what teams are working on this and how do, do they approach this? If you could elaborate a little bit more on that. One of the ways, but um, well, there's two things we do there. One is often it's the self-reporting is our indicator. So certain types of harms, anybody reports it and we remove it because it's just so egregious, it comes down. Other things, our signal is if the person that is the target of it, if they report it, that is our signal that it's considered harmful. So that if, if you call me a jerk in a loving way and I don't find it offensive, then that is that is our signal that you're not offended by it. And you think, and it's an inside joke and it's something fine. But if you report it because you actually do find it offensive, that is our signal that you're the, the target, you find it offensive, we will remove it. So sometimes the policy is the person who's targeted by it has to be the reporter of it. And that's how we know that you don't want it. Um, so that's, our policy lines occasionally um, require the person that is targeted to be the reporter, and that's our signal that it's not consensual, it's not desired, it's not okay. Um, and then other times, like hate speech, it doesn't matter. If you know, if it's a slur, it's a slur, and you know anybody can report it, um, or our proactive detection catches it, which is is always better. Um, but when it comes to developing policies to get that line. 
um, to balance freedom of expression, which is something that we care about deeply as a company, and you know what is harmful, the way that we sort of balance that is we work with thousands of experts around the world. We work with nonprofits, gender-based violence activists from every single region. We work with academic experts on speech. And whenever we are creating a new policy or refining a current policy, we don't do that without a very complex process. And we share that process publicly. If you go to our community standards um, on you know, facebook.com, you'll actually see um, our whole process. We make it very visible. We share our notes. We share our slide decks. We share who we met with. We talk about how many academics, from which regions, how many NGOs, and then where they landed, what feedback we got from the different experts, and then where we as a company decided to move the policy line, or perhaps we decided not to change the policy and why not. And we have this very complex process that I used to help I was one of those external stakeholders in my previous life, giving advice to the company on the policy line. And now in my current role, I'm reaching out to gender-based violence experts all over the world, asking for their feedback, um, saying we're, we're working on this policy proposal. Can you tell me what you think and how will this impact your community in you know, the Middle East, in Southeast Asia, in Australia? And we won't move a policy unless we have you know, complete geographic diversity, um, different communities represented. And it makes, it ensures that we're getting uh, a diverse group of voices and balancing expression and safety. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, that's impressive. Thank you so much, Cindy, for, for sharing this. Um, I would like to move now to another section, uh, if we can talk about a little bit, a little bit about education, because I was wondering if, um, you know, digital literacy is a high priority for Meta and whether there are some educational programs that Meta is working on. Um, is it important and what type of efforts um, uh, is the company making? So we've been doing digital literacy programming for many, many years. We've been launching them in schools, launching them um, with parent programs. We've got websites, um, and and often we've repackaged them in a community or in a in a continent uh, under different names to make sure that it it resonates. Uh, but this is something that we're very passionate about because no matter you know what we offer in terms of help centers and resources, if our users don't feel confident speaking up, being allies, you know, feeling confident about their use of the internet, it just, it's not going to work. It, it's sort of a, a total approach. And we also know that it's not just young people, it's, it's parents, it's grandparents, it's educators, it's caregivers, it's the whole community that needs to feel confident about tech use. Um, in the you know gender-based violence world, I know one of the things that I was passionate about is, and I sort of founded the Safety Net Tech Project 24 years ago because I realized the survivors calling the abuse helplines were more tech savvy than the victim advocates answering the helplines. And so we needed to bring up the technology literacy of those helpline workers um, because they couldn't safety plan about high tech stalking if they didn't understand the technology themselves. So digital literacy is something that Meta is passionate about. And we work very closely with our NGO partners around the world on this. And then beyond those sort of separate efforts, one of the things we're doing more and more of is providing education at the right time. So in addition to our help centers and our safety center that I'll chat about in a moment, we're doing more in-app education at the moment you might need the information. So for example, if you report non-consensual intimate imagery to us, we'll act on that report, like I mentioned, with you know 70 languages 24 seven. But after you've made the report, we will upsell to you stopncii.org and take it down.nicmic.org and additional resources like crisis lines, we'll, we will offer those resources to you. If you report bullying and harassment to us, we might upsell how to block a user. We might upsell how to use restrict um, as a tool on Instagram. And the beauty of restrict is if you restrict a user, they don't know they've been restricted. And so you don't see their posts anymore, but and they don't see your posts anymore, but they don't realize they've been put in this category. 
So it's a great way. To, so you haven't sort of unfriended them. They still think everything's normal, but you don't have to deal with them so much. Um, and there's great tools like that that we can upsell in the moment when you need it. Because if we upsell it just any old day, it may not resonate. You may be like, blah, 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 whatever. Why are you telling me this? But when you've just had perhaps a negative interaction with someone, they've ruffled your feathers, you're annoyed. That's when you want to know that information. So that's when we may try to surface some light education to our users. You know, hey, did you know about this feature when it matters the most? Yeah, yeah. And that sounds like a very efficient strategy to customize this type of responses and actually, you know, target only those who are specifically in need in a particular moment of their life. So that's really good. Um, I know that a couple of years ago, there was a big educational um, resource uh, that ca came uh, that was released. It was a Women's Safety Hub. Yep. Am I correct? Yes. Yes. Could, could, could you tell us more about this? We have, uh, it's now safety.meta.com is our safety center. And in there, you have access to all the resources. And we, we link you to everything pretty much under the sun. We have special resources um, for in our, we have a section for on women's safety. We have a section on LGBTQ plus safety. Um, we can get you right into our family center, which if you want to go straight there, it's familycenter.meta.com, but you don't have to remember that. If you just do safety.meta.com, it's a clearinghouse for all of our safety resources, our well-being resources, our sextortion prevention efforts. Um, there's information on youth well-being and there are non-consensual intimate image prevention efforts everything is in one place and all you have to know is safety.meta.com and it has um, information on bullying and harassment information for women running for office journalists activists it's all in one place and you can go in and, and read guides in different languages there's um, tools that you can turn on. And like I mentioned, restrict. Um, there's information about those special tools. There's information about our policies. So it's all in there. And you can go and search by um, by community. So you could look for LGBTQ resources or women. You can also go in for journalists and activists. You can look teens, parents, there's, you know, you can go in and look at it by community or by topic. If you want to go in and look at bullying and harassment prevention, you can go in and, and slice it that way and um, check out all those resources. Thank you, Cindy. I feel like there are so many useful resources uh, that has been shared already so far. We'll make sure to list them all in the uh, under the video so uh, our audience can access it as well. Um, so I think I, I came to my last question and I would like to ask you, Cindy, what what type of advice would you give to young people and to their parents um, to make sure that they know how to navigate online world more safely and responsibly? What would you recommend them? My recommendation is to use the tools. Uh, we have so many tools to help people feel in control of their online experience. And whether that is, you know, muting and restricting so that you feel empowered when you're online. Um, and and that can be, you know, because you've got a relative who comments on everything you post and you're just colossally embarrassed. Like, will you please stop saying you love everything I post? It's it's a little much. You could put them in restrict temporarily or mute them a little bit um, just because you want a little break from them. Um, you know, we also have some phenomenal resources that we just launched um, and announced where now if, you know, I don't follow you on Instagram and you want to meet up for a podcast, you can only message me one time and you can only message me with text. So you can't send an image, a video or a voice note, which you can perhaps imagine what we're preventing there. So you can't send any explicit content, not that you would, but you're prevented from doing it. And so and then it also by only being able to send one text, you can't keep saying, hey, did you want to have coffee? Did you want to have coffee? Did you want to get together? So it for me, operationalizes the concept of consent, which coming from the gender-based violence prevention world, that's a really exciting feature. And it's just a simple Instagram DM feature that we announced last August. And so we're doing things like that to give put control back in the hands of our users and prevent cyber flashing. And then we just announced um, a few weeks ago that we're testing on-device nudity blurring so that if, if 
you turn this feature on if you're over 18, and it'll be turned on by default if you're under 18. If, if you do get um, a nude image um, from somebody you do follow, perhaps you're, you're in a relationship, somebody sends you a nude or near nude image, it'll be blurred by and you'd, you'd have to click through to see it. And you can also report it because perhaps you didn't want to receive that image. You want to receive help. We'll also be linking, here's crisis lines, here's sextortion resources, here's takeitdown.nicmic.org and stopncii.org. So we're making sure we're linking people to the help they need. But we want to make sure people know about block and restrict and mute when they need it because we want people to have, to feel in control of their online experience and, and take advantage of all those tools. Yeah, yeah, very well said. I feel like most of the time we really don't know what opportunities are out there. And I think it's really important that we can use those tools because they're out there to, to prevent online risks. Uh, if I may add as well, um, as a part of Better Internet for Kids project that I uh, mentioned earlier, we're uh, coordinating the network of safe internet centers that are also there to for any support, for any guidance that uh, young people and adults also need to you know, um, address certain certain uh, situations. Um, we'll definitely leave all the links there <laughs> so people can access it. Um, so I think I would draw this uh, podcast to an end. Thank you so much, Cindy, for joining us today and for your beautiful insights and sharing this expertise with us, uh, for looking into amazing efforts that Meta is doing. I think it's really, really um it, it should be known and it should be much more promoted to um, to the audience. So thank you so much. And thanks a lot to our audience who was there with us today and uh, listened to this, uh, to this podcast. I would like to take a moment to introduce the Manable Toolbox to you. It is an educational tool that consists of quizzes, dilemmas, and challenges that young people can engage with independently or with help of adults. If you'd like to be up to date to, with the ongoing efforts on tackling online gender-based violence, please follow Manable Project on Instagram and TikTok channels and also at the website manable.eu. Please comment on this episode if you'd like to cover, have a conversation going and uh, stay, uh, stay tuned for the next next uh, European School Net uh, podcast series. Until next time, stay safe and take care. Goodbye.